those improvements in our relations uh, internationally. Sure. Uh, well, my relation to the Council on Hemispheric Affairs really goes back to uh, the late 70s, early 80s, when uh, I was able to use the work of the Council uh, to, in solidarity work, to expose uh, the underside of U.S. policy, for example, during the civil wars uh, in Central America, the, the horrific toll in terms of human hardship and human life. Uh, Larry founded this, Larry Burns founded this organization in 1975, and one of his motivations was his horror at the coup uh, in Chile. Uh, so he came to DC with very little resources, uh, but within a few years uh, became a prominent cr ethical critical voice uh, on U.S. relations uh, to Latin America. So it was the council that also provided um, a line of communication to staff in the U.S. Congress. And that was very strategic uh, because there was a lot of confidence in the, the high level quality of research uh, that the council put out. Uh, so it wasn't really agitational type of, uh, of communications. It was more uh, research and, and uh, mm -hmm. A journalistic type of interventions. Uh, and he also had an intern pro, uh, internship program uh, that brought young scholars from all over the United States and sometimes internationally uh, to help produce and edit uh, articles. So uh, the idea, I think, that prevailed from this early period, even up until uh, till today, was that the council exposes uh, the underside of uh, U.S. exceptionalism, uh, and it shows the contradictions uh, in the Monroe Doctrine. And so the appeal is not just to the left, but the left-leaning liberals who pretend to have certain um, ideals of, you know, democracy and freedom and these sorts of things. Uh, and what we do is expose uh, in a language I think that's, that's ample enough uh, for people to be receptive of different ideological orientation, it exposes that sometimes liberalism is an apologetic mm. for crimes yes. against humanity. Uh, and so that was a special talent of Larry Burns. He could do it with sarcasm, with humor, um, and in a way that wakes people up that were otherwise, I think, asleep. Um, so cause evolved, uh, Larry passed away two years ago, and that's when Patricio and I stepped in uh, to play a leadership role uh, to continue this legacy. Uh, but some of that evolution, uh, we have a great respect for uh, the philosophy of liberation that's emerged in Latin America uh, going back to the 60s and it's becoming more prominent uh, right now. And this philosophy of liberation teaches us that we have to decolonize our minds right here in the North that we can't pretend to know what it's like to have the point of view of those uh, undergoing uh, the attacks on their sovereignty in the South. Uh, so uh, our senior fellows have been very involved in delegations to Venezuela, uh, Nicaragua, Bolivia. Um, we have participated as election observers. Uh, most recently, uh, some of our fellows have been in Ecuador during the protests, in Chile during the protests. Uh, one is in Mexico right now. Uh, William Camacaro spent an entire year in Venezuela and has recently come back. Uh, so we combine uh, scholarship with uh, trying to maintain an organic relationship. Uh, in Spanish, the word is convivencia to live with, to live among. Uh, and so that gives us, I think, a special link and bond to what we're trying to talk about. So uh, what are, there's basically three fundamental values in the ethics of liberation that uh, one of its co-founders uh, puts very well. And it's just briefly that we ought to defend human life and community and the biosphere. And the second principle is that we ought to pursue this using democratic procedures where everyone has an equal voice, everyone impacted has a voice. And the third is that whatever we try, 
should be within reason feasible, something uh, we can accomplish. And to me, uh, and I think to many of our senior fellows, this light, so to speak, this shedding light on a path forward, a lot of it's coming from the global south. Um, the social contract uh, of Rousseau, of Hobbes and others has turned out to be a racial contract. And so where we see a lot of this um, liberatory thought is coming from the South. So the, I'll just give one concrete example of where this all ties in was the recent coup in Bolivia, the subversion of a democratic election, whatever you think of Evo running again, uh, this was a, a democratic election, no empirical evidence of fraud. And the OAS and the State Department backed an extreme right-wing coup. And the image of the Bible being brought in to the presidential uh, building and the Wipala, the flag of the indigenous peoples being burned and indigenous peoples being humiliated. What it showed, and, and no indignation from the OAS or Human Rights Watch, no, this was a return to democracy. So it exposed that we need not just to overcome Monroeism, but a post-colonial foreign policy. And uh, I would like to just mention our link to uh, US progressive organizations. When the embassy in Georgetown in DC um, was being defended by activists, uh, anti-war activists and other progressive groups, were defending the embassy from it being taken over by a self-proclaimed uh, president and his supporters. Uh, we actually uh, had uh, some of our uh, senior fellows and, and myself, Patricia, we were on the ground there too. And what we found was there was a natural uh, alliance between those fighting for social justice here and those fighting for it in Latin America. And that in order to have a U.S., in order to try to build a more constructive U.S. Latin America policy, we needed to have a global perspective, a geopolitical uh, perspective. Uh, like King said, a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So you'll see we just had a webinar on Venezuela-Iran relations, uh, and that shows links, geopolitical considerations, contextualizes um, some of the forces at play. Uh, so this in brief is, is where we are now. We're continuing our work. Uh, most recently, we nominated uh, the uh, Henry Reeve Brigade, uh, International um, Medical Brigade for the Nobel Peace Prize. And the committee um, is considering our nomination. Uh, we've also had recent articles on Nicaragua, uh, Venezuela, Bolivia, um, the recent uh, offer of asylum to Julian Assange by the president of Mexico. Uh, we wrote a piece on that because again, we see the links uh, between our main focus, hemispheric affairs and uh, world affairs. We had several articles on COVID-19 and the different responses throughout the hemisphere. And I learned a lot from that. Uh, for example, I thought the only correct response was a lockdown and uh, what I learned after realizing that in some countries, the informal sector, people selling stuff in the streets was so big that it would cause starvation if we had a lockdown. Then I opened up to seeing that there were other strategies uh, for dealing with COVID-19. And also we realized that the underside of the capital system uh, is revealed transparently with this pandemic. In other words, the, the inequalities uh, and the hierarchies of domination uh, come yeah. out in full transparent view in case people hadn't seen it uh, more uh, than ever. So that in short is what we stand for, a little bit of our history and why we, we're really honored to, to be invited to, to this coalition. Well, um, the COVID Global Solidarity Coalition is uh, really pleased and excited that you 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 joined us today and I hope that you can stick around as as long as possible. Uh, Patricia, uh, were you going to add anything? I need to get David in as soon as possible, but sure, sure. 
Um, no, I just want to add uh, some uh, information about what, what we do. We are, we are basically an academic, each like an academic uh, organization. Uh, we are trying to cover that niche very, very with progressive values. We don't have a lot of think tanks uh, representing the action left. I'm not talking about the social democrat. I'm talking about the actual left. Yes. So we, we are trying to cover that that space. Uh, we have uh, right now five senior research fellows. We also have a couple of analysts, and and we have a bunch of collaborators in a lot of countries. Um, I just want to mention as well. We just to give you some information about our level of outreach. We have around 270,000 readers per year, uh, approximately 25,000 users per month. Uh, we have our Facebook account very active, our Twitter account as well. We have a subscription uh, through email. Um, and we have a very strong presence in the media. Uh, all of us, um, the senior fellows, uh, Fred, myself, we have a permanent uh, presence in, in in the media, doing analysis, being interviewed as sources from Latin America in both languages. We also have uh, a, the publication, Fred mentioned a little bit of that, but just, just to mention it, that we have information in English, in Spanish, in Portuguese, and a little bit of French. We haven't developed that latest one, but we, we, we have basically four languages uh, and trying to even grow more. So yeah, so that's, that's that's is something extra I can add. Great, great. Well, thanks, Patricio. And again, thanks to the Council on Hemispheric Affairs for joining us. Um, I'm going to turn, turn it over to David um, uh, Adler uh, with uh, Progressive International. And um, uh, we would love to get to know you uh, be uh, better as well. Sure. <clears throat> hey, everyone. Uh, I'll be as, as brief as, as I can. I think that we share so many of the motivations that, that Frederick and, and others have already articulated, namely a concern for the fragmented nature of the contemporary left and its incapacity to kind of move from uh, a more discursive approach to a more action-oriented one. So that was a motivation for putting this together was the frightening rise of a new kind of reactionary international. Now, I think in retrospect, even looking back two years ago, that was a bit overstated. And I think that we thought that there was a that, the, that there was going to be more daylight between the Davos set and uh, and this new reactionary international. And now I think it's pretty clear that it's all just capital taking on different faces and in, in different moments of more of convenience. But uh, I think you know that was the backdrop against which we were organizing this new international. And the idea was very much to build in the grand tradition of internationals, many of which continue to exist today in various fractional forms, um, a new international that could bind together, not just um, political parties, which had been the dominant uh, form of organization and membership of past internationals, but the full range of political organizations that comprise our associational lives in the 21st century. So we live in, you know, especially speaking as a millennial, we may have more affiliate, more of a close partisan connection to our local publication, RAG, than we do to our political parties. Um, and we may have a, a deeper sense of our political commitment to a neighborhood association than we do to our trade union. So it was important that we would broaden out the scope of that membership process to individuals who may live in extreme political alienation and in contexts where they don't feel any type of representation at the organizational level, as well as the full gamut of political organizations that are doing uh, this kind of work. So we launched in May with that ambition to unite, organize, and mobilize those three main prongs um, and have been experimenting, trying to expand this internationalist toolbox. We kept in the back of our minds this mission to make solidarity more than a slogan, to move away from a kind of symbolic raised fist solidarity to one that's really grounded in a sense of collective struggle and, and, and how to make that real through various different activities. So I won't bore you with walking through what those have been, but there are a few that I think are illustrative. One would be our publishing wing. So, you know, we've built a team of 200 translators and a network of 40 publications around the world so that every art, you know, we're, we're bringing these grassroots and critical perspectives in from those, from that network. We're translating and disseminating them out back into, uh, back into the world. So 
for example, just yesterday we finished and published our sort of declaration of purpose for our electoral observer mission to Ecuador. And then we were able to translate it and, and disseminate that into you know, 10 publications relatively quickly in Chile, Brazil, Spain, United States, Germany, France, and the UK. So still on a kind of Western axis, oh, and, and India through the wire. So anyway, so that would be a, one sort of example of expanding the toolbox, taking media seriously in that regard. And then there are other types of campaigns. I mentioned this electoral observatory, Frederick spoke about the case of Bolivia. We were also present in Bolivia as observers to try to help ensure transparency and integrity of those elections. Uh, now we'll go, we were present in, in Venezuela, I'll go to Ecuador and, and we're building out this electoral observatory, getting smarter and better uh, and not well, not better resourced, unfortunately, but uh, <laughs> working with what little we have. And then most recently we, we had a big campaign around uh, Amazon, which was a bit of a proof of concept for us. So we had workers, strikes and solidarity actions in 24 countries, including you know, warehouse strikes against Amazon in, in Poland and Spain and Germany, uh, garment workers striking in, in Bangladesh, hawkers you know, go, doing solidarity actions across India, which was really about you know, organizing down the supply chain and taking on who was then the world's richest man. So that was a really interesting experience for us to build up this coalition, working with most of the trade union federations PSI, ITUC, Uniglobal Union, et cetera, as well as with organizers in, in Amazon warehouses um, like Amazon Workers International. So we have a lot of that work also in the pipeline, but you know, we're just trying to uh, also, you know, the goal for this year is to broaden the membership, bring in more organizations who are in this space where, you know, finding new opportunities to collaborate because we know it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's also a crowded space um, and deepen those relationships as well. So like I said, we're a small but growing outfit with lots of youth and enthusiasm and um, <laughs> running on fumes a bit. Um, and I am its general coordinator. So, uh, you know, and we're trying to think through really uh, the COVID question. Uh, so, you know, that's why I'm sort of really, really happy to be in conversation with you all because it seems to us that the geopolitical chess game around vaccine distribution, production distribution, et cetera, is getting more complicated by the day. And so we're having trouble thinking many steps ahead given the, um, multidimensional nature of a challenge. So, you know, the last thing we want to be doing is begging, uh, begging the pharmaceutical companies to do the right thing. Uh, at the same time, you know, our friends in Argentina are, you know, the conversation that they're having with the Russians is, is changing every day. And, you know, the prospects for a Cuban vaccine are also, you know, hugely exciting, but you know, what do you do to bank on that? So we're trying to think through the vaccine question in a very clear and articulate way that doesn't just kind of keep us anchored and focusing on a few sort of pharmaceutical corporations in the in the north and Europe in the North Atlantic specifically. So anyway, really excited to be part of this group and I hope that was a um, interest uh, a helpful summary of some of our recent activities. Uh, no, that was really great, David. And uh, we too uh, hope uh, that um, our relationships can can develop and deepen. Absolutely. Um, uh, how about um, uh, Mari, uh, would you like to proceed and uh... Uh, sure so i prepared a presentation about what we do uh, as a group was that okay uh-huh absolutely oh wonderful so let me find out how to share this okay So my name is Marie Inoue. I'm a lawyer in New York City. Um, I'm a co-founding member of Manhattan Project for a Nuclear Free World. Um, this is a volunteer-led grassroots group started a year after the Fukushima disaster when a dozen of uh, representatives of NGOs of concerned citizens gathered to talk about uh, possibility of uh, uh, organizing an event together with Fukushima mothers and children. And our mission is to undo the unconscionable labors of original Manhattan Project that unleashed nuclear weapons and nuclear energy upon the world. And we also believe that uh, our name is also a teachable moment for younger generations who do not know the original Manhattan Project because apparently American kids do not learn about Manhattan Project in school. 
and reorganize educational events, publish inform informative material like a flyer on the right, support campaigns, educate policymakers, reach out to elected officials to change nuclear policies and so on. Uh, we also organize a few trips uh, in the past um, that are directly related to the original Manhattan Project because um, the weapon program started in Manhattan at the Columbia University. And um, there is a old um, childhood home of Robert Oppenheimer's childhood home in Manhattan. And also there is a statue that survived Hiroshima bombing. And there is a former uh, storage site in Staten Island where the uranium that was used to make a Hiroshima bomb was stored for about uh, two years. And the uranium came from Belgium, Congo. And we also have been to the most radioactive place in New York City with the Geiger counter in our hands to measure how radioactive it is. Um, this is the place where a chemical plant was built about 100 years ago. And they produced rare earth metals, and they, um, which produced radioactive, um, radioactive um, polonium. And um, they were just dumping the radioactive waste in the sewage system or dumping it in their backyard. Um, and the business closed in 1954, but it took more than almost 60 years um, when the, finally the EPA designated this site as a Superfund site. And despite two inches of lead and four inches of steel, um, this block is still radioactive. And we measured about two microsieverts per hour. Um, usually in New York City, it's about uh, 0 0.05 to 0 0.2 microsieverts per hour. So it's quite high, more than 10 to 20 times higher than normal. And there are businesses in that area, which is, uh, which um, workers are now you know, wearing any protective gear. And another thing we do since 2015 is to uh, organize a peace gathering in front of the Japanese consulate to raise awareness on, and also to commemorate um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. We also set up appointment with the um, high level officials of the Japanese consulate to deliver open letter from concerned citizens and concerned um, US groups um, requesting them to play a leadership role in uh, nuclear disarmament and also play a role in um, promoting and supporting um, the peace process in the Korean Peninsula. And we've been doing it every year. And this was, uh, these are the photos from 2019. But because of the COVID-19 pandemic, last year we couldn't hold the peace gathering, um, but we were able to set up appointment with the Japanese consulate um, with the condition that we wear masks and face shields. Uh, face shields were provided by the consulate and we were able to deliver a bouquet of flower to express the apology from the US um, groups. And also the, we delivered an open letter uh, endorsed by uh, nearly 100 of groups and individuals from the US. So uh, we, instead of peace gathering in front of the building, we organized a global online event. Uh, we had an amazing program. Uh, we had a video message from an atomic bomb survivor from Hiroshima. We also had music. Um, we also showed the music uh, from Nagasaki. Um, by Inshert. They graduated from the University of Nagasaki Medical School. Um, they were both physicians. Um, and one day they were asked to make a song about atomic bomb survivors. So uh, it's available on the YouTube. So if you're interested in, I can send the link. I can share the link on the chat. But uh, we had um, amazing uh, speakers, including Professor Kuznick and other uh, representatives of uh, well-known organizations, peace organizations. 
Um, and we also talk about not just nuclear weapons, but also um, nuclear energy. Um, because if you look at the fissile material inventory uh, as of June 2020, top five countries are US, Russia, UK, France, and Japan. So Japan promotes nuclear energy. So because of that, uh, they own almost 46 tons of separated plutonium from nuclear reactors, even though they're not nuclear weapons state. Um, so uh, these some material could make additional 100,000 bombs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also talk about Fukushima disaster related issues and presentations. And we have monthly meetings and talk about issues related to that, um, such as evacuation zones or anti-nuclear energy movements that started by local family farmers, young mothers in Fukushima, which spread to the big cities and so on. And food safety standard in Japan that was implemented after the Fukushima disaster and how radiation measurement was used as a form of resistance by young mothers um, to protect their children and how citizens play a role in uh, creating this amazing radiation data map of Japan with 4,000 volunteers and um, from soil samples collected from 3,400 locations. Wow. Yeah, and this uh, English Digest edition is about 20 pages, but the original one is 200 pages in Japanese. And that book was, uh, was awarded with the most prestigious journalistic award in 2019. So um, scientists even uh, use their publication by Minano Data Site as a reference. And volunteers did that. Um, the, these are the um, graph, not graphs, maps from the book. And this is also, uh, we talk about the implication of Fukushima disaster and uh, Tokyo Olympics, how Fukushima disaster was used to uh, win the bid to host Summer Olympics in Tokyo and how the government covered up um, in order to continue to host um, the Olympics. We don't know what's going to happen this year. It was ex um, postponed to this summer, but we don't know what's going to happen. And um, we also provide platform to the victims of a nuclear disaster by sharing their video messages on our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube channel and type in our organization name, Manhattan Project for a Nuclear Free World, you'll see those uh, video messages. We wanted to share the voiceless voices um, because their voices are not heard by international communities and they all suffered uh, in so much way. And 10 years had passed, but for them, it's an ongoing disaster. And we also talk about lessons from Fukushima and you know, 10 strategies taken by the state um, in order to control, quote unquote, control the situation in Fukushima and how that is really, that is similar to the way they controlled the case of Minamata. Um, and now a couple of our members are also uh, involved in radioactive waste related issues here in the United States. And now there is a radioactive waste coalition uh, formed here in the US, um, dozens of organizations, uh, frontline communities, reactor communities are involved and we are advocating for stricter standard in terms of uh, storage of high level radioactive waste from nuclear reactors. And um, Indian Point Nuclear Power, Power Plant is located only 25 miles north of the northern border of New York City. And um, there, there were three reactors, one of them was shut down a long time ago. And the second one shut down last April. And this April, at the end of the April, um, the third one, the last one, 
will be uh, decommissioned. So a uh, lot of organizations involved in the decommissioning uh, to shut down this um, nuclear power plant, but are now the issue is how to decommission this because highly radioactive waste such as spent fuel is planned to be stored in vulnerable communities of color such as indigenous communities or Latino, um, Latino communities in Texas or New Mexico. So we are trying to stop that. Um, there is no safe permanent solution for radioactive waste from nuclear power plants. Um, so the lot, you will you will take decades to figure it out how to deal with this, and there's no clear plan, a solution, at this time. But at least we need to, um, yes, make these standards stricter so that people will be uh, protected. And last week, um, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons entered into force. And uh, we, I organized with Saudi Peace Action New York, um, Roses to Mission Action, which is to deliver rose and thank you notes to 51 uh, missions of state parties that ratified the treaty. Uh, we were able to meet ambassadors or high level officials in many of the missions, which was quite amazing experience and uplifting and inspiring experience for us. Um, so we had only four weeks to prepare and four days to deliver with four teams, 30 volunteers and 40 plus endorsing groups in the New York area. And um, we wanted to thank them because many of those small countries, mainly small countries, states, and um, yeah, these countries received enormous pressure from nuclear weapon states, not just United States. Um, despite that, they signed and ratified the treaty. So we are very thankful for that. But uh, we released a press release, um, but none of the US media show up or paid close attention to um, this event or even um, the rally that uh, we co-organized with other groups in front of the UN on January 22nd. Um, and thank you very much. Well, th well thank you, Mari. Mm -hmm. I have to say that was a very powerful presentation and oh, also very, and also very disheartening uh, at, at what we're actually up against. This is really um, uh, this incredibly um, mind boggling to think what, what how to handle all this, how to avoid further disaster. This is uh, really incredible. Um, that was really great, I appreciate it. And we, 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 all need, we all need to be in closer contact with this issue, especially. Um, uh, so uh, we have one last uh, um, uh, speaker with, um, the hands-off Venezuela group, that's Heinrich uh, Wecker. And um, I had hoped uh, that the, the real uh, exciting part, a truly exciting part would come at the end where we'd have a, all have a chance to talk to each other about what to do. What, um, uh, this is an incredibly big mess we're in. And uh, so if, uh, as long as you can stay, it's really great. Um, I see that David had to leave already, but um, uh, I'm going to um, invite Henrik, uh, Heinrich to uh, to introduce himself again and say a bit about um, um, Hands Off Venezuela, and then we'll have a chance um, to um, to think about what uh, what we're up against. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. It's an honor to be here this meeting. Uh, I'm running, as I said before, already this small anti-war cafe in downtown Berlin, and I had the, the chance to meet many activists in the peace movement here in Germany and worldwide. In the 15 years I run the place, and uh, we have many tourists, locals, and uh, art and music community in the place. 
and to go together over the years, I organized many exhibitions, art shows, jam sessions, readings, and also some petitions online and always also some outdoor protests and events. And what I would like to talk to you today about is the two projects I'm participating in. One is Hands of Venezuela. We also call it recently Frente Unido America Latina. We started in February of 2019 when uh, Juan Guaido managed to get proclaimed by Western countries, including the West, uh, the, the German government, the so-called legitimate president of Venezuela. Mm. And then we decided to do something and organize. And uh, we started a weekly vigil event in front of the US Embassy in the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. It's a landmark in Berlin where many tourists come. And with a very few breaks, we have been out there almost all Saturdays over these two years. And uh, we started also to broaden our campaign to focus on all progressive movements in Latin America. And uh, we have actively participating people from Mexico, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Chile, Cuba, Venezuela, and quite a few Germans. We always have several speakers, speakers every weekend at the event. And uh, altogether, it's an interesting, not too large uh, event, okay, but it's attracting tours. They take pictures. We have activists passing by. We meet people. We hand out flyers and uh, we document all the things on a video portal that I run from the cafe. It's called uh, Anti Walk. TV, Anti Krieg TV, you can find it on YouTube. And uh, I think it's also, this movement is also like giving some hope in this time of all this turmoil and confusion, because I think in Cuba things are still holding. Venezuela has politically stabilized somewhat. President Maduro has won the last elections. Guaido has been now dropped even by the European Union and the German government just last week. Uh, yesterday, actually, they said he's not anymore our prime candidate. They might come up with some other guy, but uh, at least they don't still don't acknowledge the Maduro government. Mm. They demand fair elections in Venezuela. But still, Guaido is, uh, Guaido is out. Bolivia has shown that miracles are sometimes possible because we have a new left government there again. And there were elections in Argentine that went out right in Mexico. We have a good president now. And uh, they together saved the life of Morales after the coup d'etat. Chile has uh, also a full year of very heavy protests that uh, on the way to the referendum for a new constitution had some success. and. Now we have the elections coming up in Ecuador, and uh, that uh, might be positive too. We all hope Nicaragua, there's an election coming up. So Brazil is there. We also have Brazilian uh, activists sometimes participating. So altogether, I think it's uh, getting a little bit more hopeful and positive in Latin America, also since since uh, Bolivia got back on its feet, it's now that the ALBA movement, the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our America is reinstituted again. And the, I think it's very important to realize for the movement that, uh, and for all people on the left, that the non-aligned nations movement is very strong and also in support of the Latin American progressive governments. And uh, I think this could have been best witnessed when this uh, event happened at the UN headquarters in New York in February of 2019, when 17 uh, representatives of countries stepped up together with uh, the Venezuelan Foreign Minister Ariaza to call for the rescue of the Charter of the United Nations and to uh, counter the illegal sanctions against Venezuela. 
and therefore announcing the formation of a coalition with a goal to defend the peace and sovereignty of all targeted countries and the United Nations Charta. And then a few months later in uh, July of 19, Venezuela hosted the annual event for the non-aligned movement, adopting the Caracas Declaration, which reaffirmed this statement from the press conference in February once again. And you had the foreign ministers from Iran, Cuba, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Palestine, attending the meeting in Venezuela, as well as the deputy foreign minister of Russia, including representatives from most other member states of that movement. And uh, in his opening speech, Venezuela's foreign minister appealed to strengthen multilateralism, promoting the right to peace and the right to decide for the future of peoples without external pressure. And he said Venezuela, as well as Cuba, Iran, Syria, Nicaragua, and North Korea are victims of interventionism by foreign powers who insist on regime change and the change of government. And then also there was a speech by the UN General Assembly President Maria Fernanda Espinosa, who said in a video transmitted speech that uh, the NAM, the Non-Aligned Nations Movement, and the UN General Assembly have to respond to major challenges together, like fighting poverty, reducing inequality, and protecting the environment and ensuring that this regime change policy stops. And in essence, that is also what our coalition, coalition here in Berlin, Frente Unido America Latina is standing for. And I think we should understand that this is very important for all progressive and left movements to understand that anyone who criticizes this policy of the West and this aggression of the West and all these sanctions, uh, who is committed to worldwide cooperation instead of confrontation, represents the interests of the majority of human mankind. And criticism of some aspects of the politics of individual states is of course necessary, but should not detract from the positive and importance of this alliance. And I think this is also very important that the progressive mo movements are no longer supported only by independent and progressive media platforms, but also by influential media networks of Russia, of China, of Latin America, like Russia Today, Sputnik News, New China TV, and Telezur. And I think this way, the progressive movements and the anti-war movements can be heard increasingly also worldwide on these channels. And the last thing I would like to mention is a campaign that also we just started here in Berlin. It's called um, Nukes are now illegal. Now out of Germany, out of Belgium, out of the Netherlands, out of Italy, and out of Turkey, because those are the places where the NATO especially the US is storing their nuclear weapons in Europe. There are more than 120 bombs, at least we know of, in these five countries in Europe alone. And we started this campaign in cooperation with the Watch of Waters from Pink Floyd and World Beyond War and a few other organizations based here in Germany, and also bringing attention to this treaty we just heard before the UN Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. We have rented large billboards here in Berlin that will start being up on uh, February 2nd for the first time for uh, two weeks. And we have also just started a paid ads campaign for social media. Roger Water has supported this campaign with a, with a large donation and also by, by World Beyond War which I represent here at my coffee in Berlin, and a few other groups also support and donate as well. And uh, 
I think it's also very important to note that Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Bolivia have all signed and ratified the treaty. And a lot of the other countries participating in this very good campaign are the people, are the countries that are represented also in the Non-Aligned Nations Alliance. Nuclear weapons threaten our security, and we now demand that Germany is supporting this UN treaty and signing it. And uh, that is about what I have to say today. And I also would like maybe to mention this, uh, we have a daily newspaper here that is also very supportive of the Venezuela Solidarity Movement. It's the Junge Welt. It's the, basically the only left daily newspaper in Berlin, actually in Germany. And uh, they are organizing uh, events for Venezuela. Like last year, there was a conference at one uh, big event place here in Berlin, the Urania. More than 750 people showed up. The vice uh, foreign minister of Venezuela, Juan Gil, was speaking, and Carlos Wimmer, and uh, some other people. And they also organized a campaign. It's called Unblock Cuba. And... Uh, we have some German politicians also in the left party, two members of parliament who are very active, and they also sometimes come to our place and uh, speak there. And altogether, I think it's uh, uh, promising that we have quite a few groups who are organizing and trying to bring more uh, dynamics to this uh, whole thing to stop this illegal and criminal policy of uh, NATO countries and uh, especially the US. And uh, hopefully we are working towards a good goal. And uh, thanks again for being here and letting me present this campaign we are doing here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Heinrich. Um, really, it's uh, you're much, much deeper in this than I had uh, ever dreamed. So I'm really excited to uh, hear about hear about all this. I want everyone to know that uh, we are, are recording, uh, taping uh, this event. So uh, we will send this to each of each of you uh, for your own review uh, when, uh, in, in, the, in the very short uh, future. Um, uh, we're excited to uh, see that Peter Kuznick has joined us and Irini Visvardi. They're also members of uh, the, the um, COVID Global Solidarity Coalition. Um, uh, Peter, would you be willing to say a word about the treaty that was just been signed at the United Nations? Among, uh, I, I think it goes so well. Um, uh, and then we could get into a general discussion about what we've uh, heard here today. Um, could you do that, Peter? Would you mind telling us about the latest uh, developments about nuclear bombs, nuclear weapons? Um, I didn't prepare to, but I sure can. Uh, <clears throat> I, <throat> I uh, did a webinar for the uh, Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament in England last week on the new ban treaty. Uh, and I uh, just did an interview about it earlier today with, with Sputnik and yesterday with another Russian television network. And uh, right when I was a couple minutes late because I was drafting my Nobel Prize nominating letter for Nihon Hidankyo, who Mari would know, uh, the Hiba leading Hibakusho organization in Japan, uh, who I nominate every year for the Nobel Peace Prize. And they actually were the favorite three years ago. However, the Nobel Committee didn't want to offend the United States by giving the Peace Prize to atomic bomb victims. So they gave it to ICANN instead for the campaign for the um, UN nuclear ban treaty, which you were just mentioning. Uh, there's so much going on. Yesterday, two very important developments. One was that the board for the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists kept the hands of the doomsday clock at 100 seconds before midnight, the closest it's ever been since the clock was begun in 1947. 
the second was an important speech yesterday at Davos by Vladimir Putin. It got almost no attention in the United States. But I got asked to do interviews on it by international uh, television yesterday. And Putin in that remarkable speech warned, he said that the combination of hypernationalism in the context of the coronavirus, uh, the, the pandemic, in the context of the widening gap between rich and poor, the rise of right-wing nationalism around the world, right-wing populism around the world, he says, put us in a position that's reminiscent of the lead up to World War II in the late 1930s. Uh, and uh, gave a very, very harsh warning, talked about the nuclear threat, the threat of annihilation, uh, and said that this is unthinkable, but not impossible, given what's going on right now. So the UN ban treaty is, uh, the, one of the wonderful ironies about it is the fact that they needed, it, it was signed in, nine, in 2017, but it didn't go into effect until it was ratified by 50 countries. The 50th country to ratify it three months ago was Honduras, the original banana republic, right? There's a wonderful irony to the fact that it was Honduras. The United States put pressure on all the countries that had uh, ratified the treaty to de-ratify it, uh, and none of them did. And then the fact that Honduras made the 50th now we're up to 52, was a wonderful development. Uh, the treaty does not affect the nine nuclear powers. Only countries that are affected by it are the ones who choose to sign. Uh, the, uh, so we still have the United States and all, other, the, all nine nuclear powers uh, who are modernizing their nuclear arsenals. Right. The U.S. is spending close to $2 trillion to do that. Obama was the one who did that 30-year modernization program. But all nine nuclear powers are modernizing, making their nuclear arsenals more efficient and more lethal. Biden did yesterday say that he was going to extend the New START Treaty. As we all know, the U.S. has dismantled every other nuclear treaty there is beginning with the ABM treaty in 2002, then the Iran nuclear deal, then the INF treaty, then the, uh, the Open Skies treaty. So fortunately, Putin has been urging the US to extend the New START treaty for five years since the first phone conversation he had with Trump back in 2017. Now Biden has said he's gonna do so. So this is, we were talking about some promising developments in Latin America. There are actually some promising developments in the US too. If we look at the Biden crew he brought in there, Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, Victoria Newland, uh, what's her name from Harvard, um, who's a new uh, head of agency, Samantha Power. These people are all interventionists, militarists, and, yeah. and, and uh, strongly anti-Russian. But there are also a couple of statesmen in there. We've got Wendy Sherman. We've got Bill Burns, the former ambassador to Russia. So we've got some positive developments also. They're not all uh, kind of crazy hawk confrontationalists in there. And Biden's own track record on foreign policy uh, is a mixed one. We can get into that in detail, but you don't need to hear that from me right now. Anyway, it looks like we're losing people. So. Um, why don't we, um, you know, Harry, you take it over again and. Uh, okay. Well, um, uh, at this point, I, we had uh, thought that we would uh, open it up um, uh, to think about uh, what, uh, what is possible, um, what, um, uh, what, what kinds of approaches would, uh, and especially what do we, um, not doing is there is there something that we're not doing that we could be doing uh, but uh, we need to think about how in the world we um, uh, began to um, push these positive developments and 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 more uh, in a direction where we do not 
um, end up uh, in a nuclear war or continuing uh, to uh, to destroy the environment um, with um, with consumption and, and pollution. So um, I, I guess we just open it up, uh, open up the floor uh, uh, to anyone who would like to contribute in terms of um, possible um, uh, uh, new ideas or possible things that we could do. Uh, I certainly um, am excited about the, uh, and Mari, I'll get right to you, uh, but I'm really excited about how we've learned so much about each group and how we, we, could, we can work together. We can, we can uh, be better uh, informed about each other and, um, and feel more comfortable working together. Mari, you wanted to um, uh, say something? Yes, so I wanted to ask a question to every single one of you. I think the next big step is to come up with the plan to make all nine nuclear weapon states sit down and sign a legally binding agreement to destroy nuclear weapons according to the treaty. But how are we going to do that? And I think that uh, you know, uh, implementing um, no first use policy or limiting um, president's power to use nuclear weapons without congressional approval here in the United States will be small steps. But other than that, I, I think that we need to do a big, you know, brainstorming thing with um, NATO countries because, you know, United States cannot do this alone. And all nuclear weapon states um, and residents of uh, nuclear weapon states, as well as those countries rely on the so-called nuclear umbrella of the nuclear weapon states have to uh, figure it out a way. So I, I'd like to ask uh, you any ideas, suggestions. Um, any, would anyone like to respond? Uh, surely, Heinrich. I would, like to, I would like to suggest that it's uh, very important to understand that uh, the aggression is basically coming from the West, you know. I think that Russia and China are being demonized in an unbelievable way, you know. They were always, uh, since the Manhattan Project, since the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they were always also in the crosshairs of uh, US nuclear policy. There were always uh, plans being drawn up to destroy many cities in the Soviet Union, many cities in China. So I think we have to uh, find some understanding that these countries cannot just lay down their arms and sign the contract uh, and being full of trust about uh, their counterparts uh, not uh, doing this really. So I think that is the, the utmost importance to find a consensus on, on stopping to demonize these countries. For example, there's now like a unbelievable campaign running against Russia uh, on the footing of this Navalny poisoning case here in Germany, it's like all over the media. On top of that, you have this uh, Chinese uh, demonization against China on this, uh, the, the suppression of this concentration camps, this forced labor and what they talk about there in, in Xinjiang. I think it's uh, so much propaganda out there and that is why I always try to stress the, 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 the point that it's important to, to understand that the non-aligned nations movement is in solidarity, for example, with Venezuela, with Cuba, with Syria, with Iran, with all these countries, although these countries are not perfect, I'm, I'm also not perfect, but at least we, we can sitting here together and we can understand that we are on the same level we don't want to do harm to each other you know but if you have people in the room who really want to do something bad to you then you have to find out who they are and uh, i think in that sense you have to accept the fact that russia and china are supporting these countries that iran is also in there and that we have to 
from that step on kind of try to work something out in order to to de-escalate the tension and to to stand up against this demonization that is going on against so many countries for uh, for so many reasons that are really all double standard and and kind of uh, kind of uh, not real i think um uh, I, I would like to see, I, I recommended that um, people see a film discussion uh, between John Bolton and Giannis Varoufakis. I don't know if any of you got a chance to see it. I think Heinrich did get to see it. And uh, the, the principal uh, point that I thought was important about this was that you've got to see clearly where uh, uh, the right is coming from in terms of their thinking and where we, the left, is coming from. Um, uh, uh, John Bolton made it clear that um, it, it's a matter of security, 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 that uh, everybody's uh, a potential threat. And so we have to do everything we can and build every, as many nuclear bombs as we possibly can to make sure that they don't uh, threaten us. Um, Giannis Varoufakis made the point over and over again that it was the, the problem was economics, that it was um, uh, that uh, we, the instability um, uh, of, um, of, the, of the world, the instability of things is a product of the competitive nature over survival, competitive nature over, uh, over having access to resources. So, um, uh, both, um, uh, 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 both explanations have been around a long, long time and uh, are at the heart of, uh, of the, uh, the, the right and the left's uh, various positions. I'm, I'm just wondering if there's anything we can do to um, uh, promote uh, uh, the, uh, the the need for equality, that's where the economics comes in, uh, equality in the realm of economics, because we are um, constantly struggling and fighting with each other. Really, that's what neoliberalism is about. It's about, it's about opening up everybody's doors so that the United States and, and, the, and any of the powerful nations can come in at will. And, uh, and this is why Venezuela is being so demonized because they refuse to let uh, the United States in in any in any in every way that we want to come in. Uh, so, um, what is there anything to be done there? Um, um, is there anything to be done explaining to the American people that it's not um, um, uh, a, a constant um, threat that? Uh, Venezuela and Nicaragua are about to invade uh, the, the southern border of the United States, but that um, uh, it's the problem is that we don't like the particular decisions that the governments of Venezuela and, and Cuba and so forth have made that reject our uh, ability, the United States' ability to simply come in at will uh, economically and take over the country. And so um, it's, a, it's a major problem uh, between the, it, the explanation that everything is a problem of security versus uh, no, uh, the problem is, is um, having equal ability, equal access to resources so that everyone is secure. Um, uh, and again, I, this is the reason why nuclear bombs exist uh, because um, uh, it's it's about the domination control by a few over the many. So, uh, but um, uh, any, any any thoughts about that, um, and uh, any thoughts about how we help Mari uh, with um, with the um, ex with the problem of expanding nuclear weapons or or de expanding that. The, uh, getting the weapons uh, to be reduced and eliminated. Uh, I, I see that Adam's here. Um, uh, we're glad uh, glad you could make it. Um, 
would you like to add anything at this point? Or? Harry, before that, let me sure. say that I've got more interviews today dealing with the questions that Mari is raising. So I'm going to have to say goodbye. Uh, and um, I guess you'll fill us all in on what, if anything, we get, we decide how we're going to proceed <laughs> on this. Anyway, so um, well, it's good seeing you all. And thanks. And right. let's stay in touch. We are recording this, uh, Peter, so good. it'll be available uh, for everyone to review. Good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, well, uh, we're getting down to the skeleton crew, um, but um, any, uh, any thoughts? Uh, what, uh, uh, any criticisms or, or critiques of what I, the, what I was trying to say, that uh, uh, the right has an explanation for everything. It's, it's the threat of the other. And the left has an explanation for all our problems, and that is competition over the resources of the planet that we all um, have to participate in because the ones with the guns do lead the way. So, uh, yeah, hi everyone. Um, if I can just say something. Um, sure. Uh, it's, uh, it's still early here, so we're, we're just coming. Uh, what, time is, what, what time um, is it, Adam? What time it's, is it? It's, it's actually not that early. It's only, it's only 10 past eight, but um, <laughs> excuse my, uh, my family breakfast mode. Um, so I'd say that uh, I, I would combine what Heinrich said and what Murray and Peter said. Um, and what you were saying also, Harry, I think all of those perspectives are valid and but coming from different or working in different areas. So Mari and Peter, for example, are working very closely in the uh, anti-nuclear nuclear arms control, um, nuclear weapons uh, activism area, which is quite, um, quite specific in its approach. It's very bound to UN treaties and to law and international relations within that framework, within that arms control framework. And there's not a lot of room for bringing in the other uh, more leftist um, anti-capitalist approaches that you were talking about, Harry, um, unfortunately. Uh, but it's also deliberate because it's so specifically um, organized to deal with those laws and to deal with those uh, relations that have been built up over 50 years, that it's developed its own unique language and its own approach. But I think that really, if we're serious about trying to address those contradictions that Heinrich was talking about, with namely some nations who are nuclear powered or, yeah, mostly the weaker nations who have nuclear weapons, say South Korea, uh, say North Korea, and uh, and the problem around Iran, um, but also earlier China and Russia, you know, in the in Soviet Union in the 1950s, when they were developing their nuclear capacity, they were very much weaker, and they were coming from a, a distinct, different, distinctly different position than the United States uh, and its allies. So. Even though you call, you know, the, the general term is nuclear weapons nations, nine nuclear weapons states. In fact, within those nine, each has their own very distinct um, strategic approach and reason for developing nuclear weapons. So unless you pick that apart and say, well, this country has them because of this historical legacy and this strategic situation, then it's very difficult to lump them all together and demand them to disarm. Um, and I think that that's what Heinrich was getting at when he was saying that uh, you, you've got to stop demonizing these countries. That demonization is a very deliberate strategy that comes with a historical legacy. So, you know, I've written article and articles about this, um, talking about the connection, say, between the oil distribution and control system and nuclear weapons, or uh, more recently about the sort of 
uh, the legacy of the development of nuclear violence um, over since the beginnings um, from well actually since World War One. So looking at that legacy from that historical perspective, you start to understand why certain countries developed that capability in response and also in order to lead and control. So the US very much being in the latter category. Um, it is a form of control and domination, but it's also with, a, with the idea from the US standpoint that you've got to have a hegemonic leader in the world order and that needs to be, uh, that control needs to be enforced and the way of enforcing Teeth, if you like, are the nuclear is the nuclear capability, Giannis Varoufakis, um, because as you're saying, they're talking at completely different um, aims and and logics and frameworks. But the reality is that we're going to destroy ourselves, so we have to do something. So I think a healthy sort of mix um, where you bring through the economic conditions much more strongly and say this is the situation that we're in now the crises multiple crises that we have are going to um, end human existence in any sort of reasonable uh, comfortable manner uh, unless we do something the the it's becoming you know increasingly uh, difficult to sustain our way of life um, for anyone let alone let alone the the uh, the vast majority of poor people in the world um, and we just can't afford them. So, you know, it's ridiculous. We, we need to do something and we need to um, have, a, have a clear uh, standpoint that doesn't follow along the same logics that we've had before. So I think, yeah, nuclear arms, arms control is okay, but for 60 years now, you know, it's been going on and it's been glacial. It's great that the TPNW is in, um, but, uh, as we can see, the non-nuclear weapon states and their, and their allies who benefit from extended deterrence are not going to give them up. I'm not, I'm not saying that the, the TPNW isn't doing great work. It's going to do great work. Um, but we have problems, so we need new strategies. And I think the, the crises, the economics are really push home in relation to nuclear, but also in relation to the you know, planetary survival. That logic also, planetary survival in relation to you know, climate change, um, can be wedded very neatly with, with the anti-nuclear campaign. But the anti-nuclear people need to break out of that framework um, uh, the, those anti the, that sort of armed control logic. I've been watching it happen day in day out. Um, Alice Slater with the with the with the various arms control people, the wonks they call themselves, and they're just arguing among themselves over technicalities and and uh, and whether or not to stick to the step by step glacial approach, or whether to you know demand sign up to the TPNW. Um, uh, I, that's my that's my thought. I can I can get into much more detail. Uh, as I was saying, I've written these articles, so I've done quite a bit of work around there, um, and happy to share some of that that work if that's worthwhile, if that's a contribution um, that that can be included. Um, otherwise, yeah, I, that's that's what I'm thinking about. Well, well, thank you, Adam, and. I'd like to ask um, Mari, how does she think we can help her? And especially along the lines that Adam was just speaking. What do you think, Mari? Yeah. Well, I, I was about to ask a question to you, um, <laughs> to all of you. So yeah, thank you. Um, so um, Henrik uh, talked about the importance of de-escalating tensions. And I'd like to know what kind of um, tactics have you done as a civil society group to de-escalate tensions between two states? Because um, was it last year, about last year, when Trump administration was trying to start a war against Iran, um, dozen of peace organizations, representatives of peace organizations uh, visited uh, the UN ambassador of Iran in New York City. Um, and we told them that um, people in the United States now want a war with Iran. Um, that kind of um, tactic 
uh, we have tried in the past, but if you have any other suggestions, um, because I'm sure that United States play a role in creating tensions when so many countries around the world, and it will be helpful to know um, useful tactics that you have used. Well, um, I'll just make a quick comment and let whoever wants to get in uh, ask. Why, uh, why don't we uh, in re request over and over and over again that we have discussions and debates open on our um, so-called free press uh, between the leadership of Iran or, and the leadership of the United States and let, let's have a discussion debate. Uh, let's, let's have a serious democracy in, in the world uh, as, a, uh, as a possible way. I, I've always found that, uh, op um, that open discussion uh, usually uh, sheds a lot of light on where the problems are. So uh, uh, just an idea, it's a thought. What, uh, let us have um, on mainstream television some serious discussions between the, the conflictual parties. But, uh, is anyone, uh, 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 Rhonda, any, anyone? Uh, uh, yeah, um, I just, uh, I'm just, uh, you know, disappointed that people couldn't stay because this is exactly what we needed, this kind of discussion, which is how can we cooperate? What are, what are the things that we feel we can't cooperate or there isn't room? And so I, you know, Harry, thank you for setting this up, but I really think that we should have, or maybe we can repeat this um, because we, we spent a lot of time on the introduction, but we really didn't get to the discussion. But for me, um, who isn't really aligned with anybody or any group per, per se, I still, you know, I, this is what I need to hear because I'm struggling to see how we can make these connections and networks. Like, you know, it seems like, you know, you're saying, well, it has to be only capital or capitalism, but we have to work with governments because governments are gonna be signing on or off. And so the state will always be part of our um, conflict or, you know, a member of something that, you know, um, that we're con a contender, I guess. And so I just don't see how how we can come, you know, come together with all these issues and still have something meaningful, except in terms of specific strategies that have been successful in different groups. And I think, again, if we have maybe in those strategies rather than causes, that might help. Um, because I'm feeling a little lost of where we're going or how we can continue to say we're going to be this broad um, group that brings different issues together when in the end, if we start to talk about issues, they quickly um, become very particular and very specific. And if you're not knowledgeable on the specific issue, you feel like you're lost or that you're not welcome or that you have to sign on to something that's already done. And so that's just where I'm at. Um, maybe I'd, I'd always like to hear more tactics, uh, successful tactics. And I mean, tactics that don't work either um, are important. But wouldn't it be for starters, like an idea to understand that this non-aligned nations movement is consisting of 120 countries. They're all UN member states. They make up the majority of the world population. They are supported on top of it by China and Russia. China is, by the way, also supporting this uh, treaty, the UN treaty, in general, saying they would like to come it into place and they would be welcoming destroying all their nuclear arms, but they're talking about the danger of this escalating world geopolitical situation. So if you see the fact that I think we have to look up to this diplomacy in a way. If you see the foreign ministers of so many countries coming together and saying we are standing in solidarity, whatever issues we have on certain topics, still we are working together. You are like capitalist and you are like doing this and that, but still we need to work together. We need to go forward to peace and to prosperity and to 
development of our nations. And I think this is uh, happening in this movement that is the block that was founded in 61 by Nehru, uh, uh, Suguhato, NASA and some other guys. And I think that this movement is, uh, is saying the right things, you know, and it's countering, it, it's in defense against the block of nations that is maybe 40, 40 states the most, who are like extremely aggressive. They demonizing them on every point in turn, yeah. uh, sanctioning them and threatening them. So I think that is uh, the movement has to understand what this is about and support these guys. Criticize them at the same time, but also supporting them in general. And that is not taking place. For example, in Germany now, especially with the Corona crisis, we have a big division in the peace movement. There are a lot of guys who are tending to work together, even with right-leaning groups, because of these ideas of a new world order, and the Chinese are behind all this, and they released the coronavirus somewhere from a bio lab in Wuhan. It's, uh, it's madness. You, you have a lot of people who are anti-Putin, just because they feel they almost need to be, because it's such a climate of, of hate about this, that even the left guys kind of join in. Nobody's daring to speak up in a way. So that is also, I think in the US, it's also very, very much that way, I've, what I feel about at least. So that's what I, for example, like about the Latin American movements, because they're all on the left. They understand they're in big trouble, if Russia and China don't support them, they're gone. I mean, Bolivia would be gone. Venezuela would be gone if Iran and China are not supporting them. So that is why they holding hands and are in solidarity. And there's some reason for it. And I think it makes sense in a way. Uh, still, you can criticize them. But I think there's a valid understanding there that it's necessary to stand together and to show solidarity to each other. Well, I, I think we all agree that, that, we, that we definitely need to do that. <laughs> um, do, uh, uh, figuring out how to do it, uh, I, I think was kind of Mari's question. How, how do how can we do it now but um it's this is a this is a big big problem and a big issue and we're not going to solve the problems overnight but i do think that over a period of time if we continue the conversation and building our relations we have a uh, we have a much better chance um and, where Heinrich can come and he can remind us over and over again that we need to be doing this <laughs> or that. We need to um, uh, we need to be working more in, in, in solidarity. I, I was thinking along those lines, Heinrich. Uh, maybe uh, somehow we reach out to the non-aligned nations and invite them to to I don't know what to. Um, uh, uh, be on some left television like free speech tv and to present their vision of the world or their understanding of the world um we um there there are a few uh left outlets here just as there are a few left outlets in germany um but um uh, having um, having some of the um, uh, representatives from other countries, I, I don't know if um, the United States would deny them a visa, or uh, maybe we could just get them in through uh, get them in through the internet, and um, also we could uh, we could do something similar with with the nuclear um, weapons and the nuclear waste problem possibly by um, um, having um, discussions on, on some of the, um, uh, of the 
uh, left-leaning um, stations that exist. Uh, free speech TV is a, is a, is a, I think would be willing to work with, with this idea. Um, I'm sure that others, I'm sure that Democracy Now! would, would highlight um, some effort that I don't know that this is possible. Does anybody know um, what would, uh, would there be strong objections? I, I guess it probably would be, but any way to stop um, having the representatives from the non-aligned nations speak to the American public. And even though, even though on the left, these left um, uh, TV outlets don't have the greatest uh, coverage. They're not mainstream, but still, um, uh, and uh, it's still a, a possibility to have, um, uh, to have these uh, individuals come and speak to the American public through, through some of our outlets. Uh, just a, again a thought and I, I, Mari has just got me sh uh, all shook, shook up here with this uh, how serious the matter is um, uh, re regarding nuclear uh, waste and nuclear war uh, nuclear bombs I mean I've always known it's serious but um, uh, Mari's slide presentation was quite um, and I'm looking forward to go playing this back and going going back over it in much greater detail. Um, uh, I, if, if, do, 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 do we want to continue this, this discussion? Or are, are, are we getting a little um, uh, tired at the moment? Uh, do, what, what is the sentiment at the moment? Would we, do you want to continue the discussion? Or do you feel like we need to rest and come back, uh, take half time and come back <laughs> another time. Um, but uh, uh, are there- Yeah, Adam's there... had something to say for a while. Sure, sure, okay. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, I was just thinking that, although I haven't seen the slide presentation, um, that there's lots of synergy on discussions of nuclear waste, uh, nuclear issues. Um, with uh, what's going on in Australia, but also uh, quite a lot of work that I've done in that area. Um, however, I think that we're, we're talking at two, in two sections, in two areas, and Harry named them, which is one is economics and one is the, the nuclear issue. So I think we need to make a decision about um, what to focus on and who, and and how, because if you just put out a question saying, uh, well, what are our tactics? Um, we also need to define uh, for what and what are our objectives? What do we want to achieve? Um, so I'd suggest that we make those decisions and split into working groups and work on particular issues uh, and then come back together to try to find ways to bring them together rather than remaining religiously um, Trying, trying to bring them all together, you know, ec in an ecumenical way. Yeah. Um, uh, otherwise, we're talking at cross purposes, and people do get tired if and if they lose focus. Um, so, if that would be helpful, I think this kind of non-aligned movement, also support for speakers for the from the non-aligned movement, would be great. Uh, you know, we really need it. We hardly hear hear from. <laughs> the vast majority of the world uh, and speaking about you know bringing it to the American public is also problematic if we're trying to have an international group um, but the problem is the same in the sense that the mainstream media only only broadcast a very very narrow angle of what's going on in the world so those two areas the non-aligned movement and the the nuclear issue um, uh, could possibly be two areas to focus on. But I think that we also need a lot of knowledge development on this non-aligned movement uh, and the history of that. I think a reading group could be good um, in, in that area to bone up on that uh, particular uh, political movement and then to, to get experts or speakers from 
those countries' representatives who would like to speak to share their knowledge would be really valuable um, and could possibly appeal to a different audience, um, inter international audience. So as a, as a you know, small step forward, that could be a way of organizing. It might not be a tactic, but yeah. But maybe check out this article I just posted there in the chat box. Uh, that's an article I wrote like two years ago about this movement because I actually it's not very much in the mainstream media. They never talk about it. It's always this, uh, I mean, Russia today and the Chinese, they're always stressing it in a way. And I think it really also, it is connected with the nuclear treaty now too, because the majority of the, the states who signed this treaty are actually from that movement because they don't want this trouble. They're fed up with this threats and then sanctions and the whole policy that they want a different direction even having their 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 flaws and their 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 mistakes you know but i think one has to measure these qualities of of countries and of people too in a in a way nobody is 100 percent perfect and nobody is 100 percent bad i mean some people are but there's always some some scale where you can have them standing on the good side even with some mistakes and i think it's the majority and it's really interesting to read uh, how this group developed over the years and uh, and especially that the fact that the russian and the chinese are always supporting them and also the in the us you have certain websites like popular resistance the venezuelan solidarity movement they also always, uh, the, the US Peace Council, they always tend to link to them and meeting also representatives from them. So I think it's not, uh, I think it's a really good idea to look into it and maybe find uh, some, some connection because I think they also got the media. I mean, they got the Telezur, they got the New China TV, the Chinese TV, I got the Russia Today, RT America, for example, is, I think it's a very good channel. And uh, that is where we can find some. And Peter also, he was giving an interview to Sputnik today, you know, he's there on, on press TV, on the Iranian TV. It's nothing that is like a poison. It's like uh, possible to go there and to speak your mind. They don't censor you. And... Uh, then you have like other channels, for example, Amy Goodman, I also like her channel very much, but she is, for example, also sometimes very strange about what is happening in Venezuela and in Syria and in Iran. She's very strange sometimes there. You know? <laughs> uh, I don't know why, maybe for personal feelings, but I think this, this, um, the media is this the state media is actually a platform we should really look for at least uh, not demonizing it any any additional thoughts um uh, look um th this is uh, uh uh, COVID, uh, um, COVID Global Solidarity Coalition is a new group, relatively new group. We're growing. We have grown. We're, we're, we're trying. We're trying something. Um, this is the first time we've done this. Uh, the hope is, uh, and if you have some recommendations on other groups that we can meet, just as we've met with you, to further expand the connections. Uh, just as we're doing here, uh, please let us know if you can suggest, um, well, why don't you check with this group or that group? Um, um, but um, we've, we, these problems were not uh, created overnight, as everybody knows, and, and, uh, and they're not going to be solved overnight. So we have some uh, uh, time to continue uh, to reach out and again try to develop those connections that might uh, 
push us over the top or at least help us become more effective. So um, we, we don't have to solve all, all the problems today, but we are going to continue doing this. And you would all be welcome to, um, I will send the invitations out to you as well, although you, it, it might not be your group that is uh, doing the talking, um, uh, we can, you could certainly still join and, and, uh, and can, uh, and, uh, be part of the discussion, uh, as we're trying to do right now. So, um, uh, again, uh, any, any last minute thoughts, um, uh, any ideas, uh, that, um, uh, again, we're not going to solve this overnight. So, um, I mean, we, we, we can uh, let it go at, at here, or again, if there's any, if you have some additional thoughts, please, um, please just uh, go ahead and, and let us know. I would just maybe like to add one thought if you uh, could maybe support this uh, nuclear statement we do here in Berlin with the COVID-19 Solidarity Group, I would, uh, we would very much appreciate uh, if uh, we could have this on the website as well. Maybe take a look at the website. There's a lot of groups supporting it. And I very much appreciate this group here because, uh, as I told you, we have a lot of problems here in Germany with this COVID situation. And a lot of people including myself, I'm pretty much confused about it. <laughs> yes, I am too. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but it's like causing a lot of division and a lot of groups break up and have yeah. conflicts. Yeah. It's like families yeah. and it's like crazy. So uh, you know, that's, true. Uh, that's why that's I'm true. very happy to have found this group here because you have like a, like a good compass about this problem. So. <laughs> well, um... Uh, well, why, uh, send send what you have to either myself or to the group as a whole. All right. And send, send it to the group as a whole, and uh, and I will push. Uh, uh, I will push uh, getting this done. Um, so, uh, yet, yeah, Mari, did you want to uh, say something? Yes. I just uh, put the link on the chat. Um, there is a comment. Um, if you have any comment uh, against Japan's plan to dump uh, radioactive water into the Pacific from the Fukushima, uh, please send a comment by the end of this month. That's coming very soon. But uh, Gensuiki is one of the oldest and largest uh, peace uh, anti nuclear organizations in Japan. And they're collecting comments, and they have regularly set up appointments with the government agencies. So they're going to deliver your comments if you could send one by the end of uh, this month. So if you're interested in it, please share this link with your friends and colleagues. Now you're thinking the end of January? Yes. Oh, wow. 31st, <laughs> yeah. I'll share it right now. Thank you. Okay. And, um, uh, now, aren't they? Uh, they've been releasing water into the uh, into the Pacific. Uh, you, you you did say the Pacific, right? Yes. So now they are saying that they don't have enough space to keep the radioactive water in the uh, facility in the property. So they are thinking about um, dumping radioactive water from Fukushima. They say it's treated, but actually it's not. Tritium is not eliminated. Um, other radionuclides are not eliminated. And they do have a space to put more radioactive water in the facility, but, and there are other options as well. And, you know, a lot of international law violations um, associated with dumping contaminated water. Um, so, you know, there's so much issues going on. And if you click the link, you will see the um, four main reasonings why they shouldn't do this. So. Uh, I think it will be very helpful to understand what's going on there, um, even though you know you might not be able to write comments to them. 
It was my understanding that they've been doing that in the past. Is that not true? Uh, have they been containing the, all the water? They say it was leaking from oh, groundwater and so right. on, but they are not actively dumping. Okay. Right. Okay. But uh, there's no way that they can control radioactive water or um, particles coming out from the crippled pop plant because we don't, we simply do not have technology to do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, Rhonda, do, do does the chat stay with us in, uh, when uh, we can come back to it? Yes. Okay. Because uh, I, I want to do that. Yeah. Well, I I I think um, well, uh, if there are no objections, I, uh, Adam, any for any uh, last minute thought? Uh, if if there's nothing, if there's nothing more, what? Any, any, any last minute thought? Um, I'll just put a little article uh, that might be informative. Uh, from 2013, um, where I was talking about the nuclear contaminated uh, water being released into the ocean. And uh, this has been a very protracted issue a uh, very mm -hmm. typically yeah. strategic and very tactically managed issue by the Japanese government, waiting for people to get so bored with it that mm -hmm. they can eventually release the water into the sea and no one cares about it anymore because there mm -hmm. are other problems to deal with. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's clearly something that uh, is going to happen again. Um, this is... Uh, uh, a typical problem with nuclear reactors. And it's also, like I was saying before, trying to suggest we need different strategies and tactics to talk about this, different ways to keep people engaged rather than just repeating, we need to sign this um, petition about releasing, uh, I think that's really valid and really important, but if we're actually gonna move it forward, we need to talk about the nuclear industry in different ways. And one of them is mm -hmm. to say, for example, that uh, the uranium that was in the Fukushima reactors uh, comes from, uh, came from, most of it came from Australia. Um, it's a transnational nuclear industry that is bolstered by different countries. So some countries like Australian government won't complain very strongly about the release into the ocean. Countries that will um, be affected most will complain. So countries in the South Pacific, for example, so they would be getting people to, to speak about it from those countries would be really good and in fact there are quite a lot of activists from the south pacific who are anti-nuclear and very vocal and they they are very effective in complaining about how their ocean life world is going to be impacted by the radiation that the the large amounts of radiation radioactive um, water that will be released but that said i mean there's been contamination going into the ocean from day one um, from that plant every day it releases into the ocean but also into onto land into the water systems in Japan um, so it's slightly misleading um, and it's you know it, it's quite it's a very very complicated issue scientifically and there's also a lot of fudging so you get experts who fudge who don't don't um, name the problem very clearly there's a lot of uh, disingenuous kind of um, positions that are taken for various reasons. They're protecting their profession or they're, um, they're somehow invested in continuing um, their role in some way and they're not speaking as clearly as they could given their expertise. So those, those issues are really difficult. But yeah, anyway, that said, um, have a look at the article. And in that article, I talk about depleted uranium as well and how that's a, a very important, significant issue that gets overlooked. You know, there's this huge outcry about people being exposed to radiation in Japan, but uh, very comparatively little about the people who've been exposed to DU in Iraq or Serbia or um, the various countries where the US military is, has used it since 1992. Um, in Syria as well, I, I believe they've used depleted uranium. 
Um, and they're seeing, you know, the various health impacts from that use now. Um, and that's very below the, the line. That's right under the radar. That's not being talked about um, at all. So it puzzles me that, you know, there's a relative, comparatively, an enormous amount of attention paid to Fukushima, whereas there's very, very little um, paid to those people who are suffering in Iraq and Syria and Serbia. Thank you for that, Adam. So, yeah. All right. So um, let's, let's call it a, a day, an evening, and I very much appreciate uh, all of your participations. Um, uh, it's uh, not an, a simple matter, as everyone knows, and uh, this kind of work has been going on for a long time. Uh, we're just in a tradition, a tradition of a left tradition of trying to do something about the, uh, the horrors of, of our own folly. So we'll continue and uh, we, will, I'll let, uh, we will let you know when we're doing this again uh, with other groups and you can certainly join in uh, then as well if you wanted to see how, what they're saying and what their concerns are. So. Um, uh, we'll we'll do that, and I I guess we'll um, uh, if there's no further last <laughs> last word, uh, I guess we'll call it uh, call it a day. Anything? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it was great to have you here. It really was.